<laughs> I couldn't believe it. I went, oh my god, this is a Harris tweet. <laughs> I'm taking it for four bucks. Well, this is a cheap Moore's imitation. So. Actually, it's the, I bought three coats together, and the other two the lines are just in rags. This one was so hot, so I put it off the last, and now I either have to go back and buy another one or wear this. Check, 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 check. Some such amazing work to test out some of our hypothesis in ecology. Uh, 
using Hall Lake experiments that uh, David uh, had a, a great influence on. Uh, his, his work covers uh, a really broad area. Tonight he'll be talking at Science North on, on nutrient issues and our own community that invited Dave uh, to talk about blue-green algae, but uh, of course uh, uh, he had a huge role in, uh, in affecting the use of uh, phosphorus and detergents in the Great Lakes and uh, helping to eliminate uh, most of them. We've still got lots of phosphorus problems in the world. Acid rain and, uh, and uh, climate change and invasive species and uh, as you'll tell you today, uh, uh, the issues around oil and gas development, uh, which uh, ends up uh, being very close to his heart and his location. That's why he's here on the watershed science part. This is David's uh, friend and co-author, and I think hired you, didn't he? Yes. <laughs> this is Making a Difference in Society, the other part of the literary kind of sense of watersheds and watershed change, and watershed moments. Jack Valentine was also one of the most famous and was recently passed. Uh, <coughs> scientists in Canada that rose to the upper echelons of, uh, of uh, bureaucracy, Environment Canada, ended up the Center for Inland Waters, I believe, or close to the top of that. But Jack, who visited here and visited Science North, uh, realized that he couldn't make all the changes from within. And uh, he gave a good light, part of his life to being this uh, other person, Johnny Biosphere. And he wasn't a very attractive outfit, did he? He got the safari outfit going and the globe on the back, and everywhere he went for a, uh, a science talk, he also insisted, as he did in Sudbury on the occasions that he was here, that he have access to, to, uh, to talk to elementary school kids. And he put his efforts on, uh, on elementary school education. Dave doesn't ride with a globe on his back, but uh, he's He's is equally passionate about changing the way we treat this globe and uh, has made a huge difference in policy development in Canada. And with that, I'd like to call on David Schindler. Well, thank you, John, and thank you all for coming out to hear me today. Uh, the topic that I'll be speaking on, uh, the oil sands, is one of my pet peeves. It's one that uh, I spent a couple of decades resisting getting involved with when I went to Alberta and finally decided I just had to do it. So this is uh, a picture of one of the early developments. Uh, the Suncor plant was founded in 1967. And some clever soul uh, came up with this idea of dumping the water that was so toxic that we weren't allowed to put it back into the Athabasca River in these tailings ponds. This is the Athabasca down here, same bridge to nowhere that was built uh, about, about 15 years before there was any vision of development. And this night is about 100 meters high, giving some idea. Right now, there are 130 square kilometers of those tailings ponds. To give you some idea of size, uh, these are uh, in thousands of square kilometers. The oil sands area outlined here in red, and this one little area here as well, are slightly bigger than the country of Greece. And you hear a lot about how much it's going to cost to clean up the city car ponds. The relative size of the oil sands to the city car ponds, with many of the same contaminants and problems involved in the cleanup. Uh, this little pink area here is the area where they mine oil sands from the surface. They just pull those off of about 100 meters of overburden and then, then mine it just like you would mine gravel, cart it off, and clean up the sand with hot water. 
of steam and you have extracted the lumen that then permits and then it can do well. The Athabasca River is the second biggest river in Alberta and uh, it starts in the continental divide uh, right in Jasper National Park. It flows diagonally across the province, uh, turns due north uh, right at Fort McMurray and a couple of hundred kilometers downstream and dumps into the western end of Lake Athabasca. And it's joined there by the Peace River, which is three times the size, and to it and go out is the Slaker, which flows down the Great Slave Lake. But this delta area where the two rivers meet is a tremendously rich uh, wildlife preserve, lots of, of fish and muskrats waterfowl, and as a result, there are several thousand native people who've lived there since well before uh, white Europeans appeared. It's the second uh, our biggest community, in, our second oldest community in, in uh, Western Canada. So you hear a lot about uh, uh, the car sands. This is uh, some pronouncements by our ex-premier in Stelmach, but why that uh, frequency change, I hope you can read it, but uh, lots of public relations, $25 million worth of advertising last year to how great the tar sands are, uh, or oil sands as they call them. Uh, if you step in them, you know the tar, but uh, oil, we think, is better for the image. And you don't hear anything about the downside. So I'm going to talk mostly about the downside today. These are just some statistics. This is the Suncor facility that I showed you. About 10 years later, Sinkru uh, joined them. Not much happened for a long time. You can see this flat period in, in the output line here. And then when oil prices started going up, suddenly Suncor expanded, Sinkru expanded, uh, Shell Oil came on stream. Uh, this uh, Shell Albion Jack Pine mine will soon be on stream. Imperial Oil has been approved, uh, and all of these have been approved. So uh, these are all going to be in production. You can see this exponential rise in output if you plot it over time. And due to calculations, it comes out to 7.5% per year compounded for a dumping time of every 10 years. That's an insane rate of development. Uh, usually, it, we, uh, almost any type of development you talk about, when you start getting over 3% per year, you end up with some shortcomings. Uh, roads, schools, hospitals, uh, you name it. All of those are uh, having major problems, not only in the oil sands area in Fort McMurray, but in all of Alberta. Nobody wants a low-paying job because if you've got third-grade education, you can take a six-week uh, course and earn $100,000 a year and can be an operator. So uh, we have a, a lot of teenagers who don't finish high school. Why should you finish high school? go off and have to spend a lot of money at a university to get a degree when you could be making $100,000 a year through that whole period, not having the sum. So we have ended up with a landscape that looks like this. Uh, this again is, is the river. All of these developments are in one area. I'm talking here about the ones that are surface viable. Uh, and each of them is required to do cumulative effects assessment, but only on its own plot of land. And each of these plots is about the size of a township, 100 square kilometers. And each hearing pronounces it as no significant impact. Well, if this is no significant impact, they must think we're all idiots. And I think this is the real problem they're having with the resistance in, in Europe and other countries from uh, buying oil sands or oil. People in general are just not stupid enough to buy this sort of thing. I don't care how much money you spend on PR. You 
village idiot that walked in town to tell you that it's, it's significant to the planet. The real uh, story, I think, is represented in this uh, Heartland Institute analysis. Uh, Heartland Institute is uh, a sort of mid-center institute at the University of Alberta. Uh, they, the politicians think it's extreme left wing. Uh, but in their analysis of uh, the tar sands and the royalties that are being paid, this is what they have concluded. Two years ago, uh, the then premier had a study done by oil sands people and company CEOs that recommended the royalties needed to be doubled because they were the lowest royalties in the world. And the premier announced that he would do that. And then, under attack by all the oil companies who threatened to move to BC and cut their development things, he relented. So, what we have now is a $3.1 billion deficit in a, in a province with $100 a barrel of oil that's uh, increasing in production at 7.5% a year. It's an equation that just doesn't make sense. So this is my list, uh, deliberately copied the premier's format here. What I see is the, the major problems. I'll talk a little bit about a few of them, but not all. You hear a lot about carbon emissions and greenhouse gases, so I will not talk about that. I'll talk about unsustainable water use in the past. I uh, have biodiversity loss and some of these other things. So today I'm going to focus on reclamation, on water pollution, and uh, uh, some of these so social disruption that's occurring downstream. There's a lot being mouthed right now at the conference in Durban about ethical oil by the uh, Minister of Environment and, and so on. This all goes back to a book by Ezra Levant a couple of years ago called Ethical Oil. Sometimes we produce ethical oil here because we don't mistreat our women, women like we do in Arabian countries, and, and we don't have a, a borders model for our resources, at least not yet. Uh, but you have to ask. So we had a treaty made with the Aboriginal people in that area in 1899, Treaty 8. As you'll see, we're violating. They don't mention that this part of the country and everywhere it used to be here doesn't get any of that ethical oil. So we're busy shipping it off to the U.S. We still uh, rely on the same unethical sources the U.S. is trying to get rid of. Reclamation is not being paid for, and in fact, as you'll see, it's not really possible. But these companies, uh, in general, are making a couple of billion dollars a quarter. And uh, last year, the provincial government spent $300,000 on its uh, on environmental programs in the Athabasca. We spent $25 million on the propaganda to tell more than something. Well, if you look at the volume from those tailings ponds, uh, this one at Faro, the, the big zinc mine in the Yukon, was the biggest in Canada until uh, the oil sands started going. This is the size of the total oil sand exposure right now. You saw how close those were to the Athabasca River. You have to ask, what happens if one of those uh, dikes breaches? This is not an uh, oil sands pond, but it's one that was located by some graduate students of mine who did a class project on Felix uh, Pond Dikes a few years ago. This one is Los Frailes in Spain. It was a fraction of the size of even a single oil sands pond. Wiped out a river system for some uh, kilometers downstream, and the cleanup costs were in the tens of millions of dollars. Now, if you think of that river, 
computer system, the Athabascos, I mentioned closing the lake Athabasca, then out into the Slave River and hit the Great Slave Lake, and then it turns the corner very quickly, and Great Slave Lake doesn't really go very far out into the lake, it goes down to the Benzie. Imagine something like this happening about this time of the year. We don't have any way to get oil out from under ice. In fact, there has been one spill already in the early 80s that uh, they stood helplessly by and watched it go all the way like Athabasca, where it closed the fisheries for a couple of years. They'll tell you that those are rare events. They'll put all the risk analysis people all over this. These students of mine found this paper that documented 184 failings problems in a 20 year period. And of course, we have other rare events that uh, are non existent uh, on the, the risk analyses of people's heads. We had two this past year. You can imagine how rare uh, a nuclear accident caused by a tsunami could be. Or uh, we were told for years and years that it was almost impossible for a deep water blowout to occur. By deep water drilling. It blew up within four months in the same year. So I don't think we do a very good job at risk assessment of extremely rare events simply because we don't have a, a, a very robust background of data to go find ways to do things like car accidents. We have hundreds per day. But most of the terrain up there looks like this. Uh, my wife, Suzanne Bailey, works in the oil sands on wetland reclamation. And she'd call this a wooded fen. It's several meters of uh, feet storing carbon. And a few spindly trees sticking out of it. it. Took several thousand years to develop. And uh, they have been worried about reclaiming this stuff for years. Despite what the shell ads tell you on TV about how they're going to put it all back just the way it was, it is possible. And any wetland scientist who's worked in the area will tell you that. They uh, always show the same two sites that they think were successful they, uh, when they're uh, producing propaganda. They don't show you sites like this, which are more abundant in their so-called reclamation areas than the uh, pretty sites. And uh, this is, is what my uh, wife would call reclamation death. This is the amount of area that they've dug up. This is the amount that they have had under what they call active reclamation. There's been one site of 100 hectares that has been certified as reclaimed. Uh, and uh, it, this gateway project to Sindhu, actually costs roughly 10 times as much per hectare as companies are required to put aside, which is about half to a third of what other mining jurisdictions require to be put aside for reclamation. So you can guess uh, who's going to pick up the difference if that area is ever going to be reclaimed. My guess is that if I were to stand here uh, uh, 50 or 60 years from now, uh, you'd find there's been almost no reclamation. This is an analysis that uh, my wife and one of her students, uh, Rebecca Rooney, and I put together that's in review right now. Rebecca did most of the GIS work on this and the mapping. Uh, it's two detail. These are actually photos of fairly large maps, but you can see the gray area on here and the rusty colored area. That's mostly wetlands. That's uh, uh, what was destroyed. When you look at this area down here, this is what we can look at. And this is taken out of the company's own reclamation plans as put in there environmental impact statements when they were approved. So 
So somehow the PR people, if they hired them, not not bothered to go back to their own statements to see what they could do. There'd be almost no wetlands. You can see these things that look like fish skeletons here. Those are the new wetlands that will be back. There will be no peatlands. The uh, wetlands that will be put back will be saline marshes uh, colonized by things that you find in close basin lakes in Saskatchewan. This will be a hilly terrain, not terrain like you've seen. The reason will be obvious if you've ever dug up a garden or planted some trees, you end up with more soil afterward than you thought you started with. And on top of that, they have to dig this lake, which is called an end pit lake. And each one of these developments has had one of those approved as replacement for the fish habitat that's been destroyed. What it is, uh, is a pit to which they run feelings into until it's almost full. Then they put about an emptier layer of fresh water on top and certify it that it's a lake. And not one of these has ever been tested to see whether it will grow fish. In fact, they know from the chemistry that it won't yet, but very optimistic that it eventually will. I guess it's maybe a geologic time. But there have been nine of these all of the uh, material from that has to be dumped on the landscape. The hills will be very unstable because of uh, very clay soil underneath the wetlands. So they have minimum uh, slopes that they will have to deal with things too. The landscape for an area uh, the size that I showed you is not going to look anything like for a landscape. And to say that it is, is just out and out brainwashing. The second problem I want to uh, bring to your attention is uh, the tree eight boundaries. You can see that this area uh, in Alberta, the outline of the red treaty, also extends well over into BC and Saskatchewan and all the way up to the Great Lake. Lake. This was signed in 1899. Uh, the, it was pushed very high, hard by the federal government, who already realized at that time that there were oil sands there that would be worth a lot of money someday. But if you look at those treaty boundaries, the red line here is actually the, the uh, traditional lands of the uh, Athabasca Chippewa, which is one land. And the shaded areas here are areas within that that have been uh, leased by the Elder government oil companies for exploration. And the docks are actual uh, sites that they've already developed that are, are wells or mines in place. So how you can claim to be guaranteed being subsistence to Aboriginal people on a landscape looks the way you've seen it, but it just totally escapes me. And uh, as you can see here, it, my boots did have a blue background. Uh, I checked this morning, I don't know what happened. But uh, there was uh, Father Rene Famolio who spent almost half a century working in that area, retired when his health deteriorated and uh, wrote a book as long as his land in that, he documents uh, interviews that he did with people who were present at the signing of Treaty 8 and uh, people who knew them. And there was tremendous pressure on people to, uh, to uh, take the money. Old Father Lacombe was almost on his deathbed, and they dragged him out of retirement and took him north because they knew he was one of the few white men that I uh, had some trust in native people, and uh, he persuaded them. And uh, that's largely the reason that they signed. And they were promised something like five bucks a year each, which was big money in those days. And they were told that this was a one-time offer. Nobody would ever offer money for that land again. But you can see this is reads like something out of a key western. As long as the sun walks and rivers flow, always, forever, always, nothing will stop you from fishing and not cutting forever. So uh, that's the 
sort of promises that we can make. See this sort of thing and what's going on. It sort of gives you the willies. Picking the hero part of this. And uh, not very long ago, we guaranteed these rights in the Canadian Constitution. How can we guarantee them in any more what's going on? Well, this, the rubber started to hit the road on this in the 1990s when people down the street started to complain that they were having people dying of cancer and they'd never known cancer before. And uh, this was recommended as a, a health study that was needed by the Northern River Basin study in 1996. But it was ignored. It resurfaced again when a local physician, John O'Connor, uh, said that he thought he was seeing very unusual rates and types of cancers. He was uh, originally censored by the Alberta uh, Health and, and uh, Health Canada and uh, uh, was not allowed to practice for a few years. And then when there were further studies done, but found that indeed cancers were at the upper end of what you'd expect by probability. Answers you could you could remotely uh, imagine how when you do epidemiology on a couple of thousand people uh, that you could I mean you can put the point fifty times and get fifty heads and cry all the time. So there are higher than expected numbers of blood and lymphatic cancers and biliary biliary breast cancers in particular. The uh, sort of warning signal to some of us was that uh, some like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, calls, call, cause biliary tract cancers in, in fish or in space. So it's not uh, too remote to think that this might also happen to people. But the Alberta government kept dismissing these claims by saying that uh, they knew that the mines were not putting any pollutants into the river because their own studies showed it. They weren't putting pollutants in. It couldn't be uh, developed in the oil sands. It was the problem. It hadn't been a long term problem that was always there. And uh, there are some tar sand seeps, little holes in the ground like this. And they don't put in anything much in the wintertime because they're frozen up. In summer, some of these have an tarry trickle that comes out of them and makes it to the river. But they're usually pretty tiny sites. Uh, they also have two big upgraders up there that burn coke that they manufacture on site. And uh, uh, they smelt this bitumen sand and extract the bitumen for synthetic fruit. Coincidentally, uh, 30 years ago, I chaired a committee for the U.S. National Academy and several Canadians and several Europeans, as well as Americans that looked at the incidence of pollution of the atmosphere and return to the biosphere by uh, smelting and uh, burning fossil fuels. We didn't find a single case that did not put pollutants back into the biosphere. So we thought that the fact that they didn't measure these airborne pollutants was pretty telling. The other thing for anybody who's worked on watersheds, when you see a scene like this, you know there are pollutants running off in the water. Watershed Science 101, you strip the vegetation and soils off a watershed, expose that fresh geological substrate for rain and snow. You know any contaminants that are in there are going to go up They run down the stream. This is the Athabasca River. Um, this isn't a particularly uh, big site, but there are lots of sites on the tributaries to the Athabasca where 50% and more of the tributaries uh, are being mined out. In fact, in some cases, they're digging up 10 kilometers of stream channel uh, just to get at the oil that lies underneath. I was kind of suspicious of the 
programs too. I played a small part in this regional aquatic monitoring program review in 2004. The main authors were three civil servants, uh, one from Environment Canada, two from Fisheries and Oceans. And uh, it's a 100 page report, about 99% of it is documenting how this program violates every rule of long term monitoring. They change chemical methods, they change spots that they sample, they change seasons that they sample. In fact, in recent years, uh, much of the river has been sampled once in late summer, probably the most benign time of the year. Uh, this second review, released in January 2011, uh, found that they had improved in one of their seven areas and that was to get themselves re-reviewed. Uh, the rest was the same as this report. This is the uh, URL if you want to look it up for yourself, or you can just Google on RAM and it'll come up. So, not the swiftest of, of monitoring programs. Of course, the ministers talked about having four million data points, more data than for any river in the world, and so on. They don't want to hear about data quality or whether the appropriate thing could be measured. That was the RAP program. The province also had a program that, I, as I mentioned, they had $300,000 to spend on. And uh, if you look at the plotting of their sites, and the five pointed stars here are sites on the Athabasca, the four pointed stars are on major tributaries. As you can see on the tributaries, they only sample one site that's near the mouth. How is it that you can take one sample downstream of industry and from that proclaim that uh, industry isn't adding anything to the river? How oh, this doesn't add up? They only had two years of data for some things. They were going to import it's like polycyclic aromatics. And the third thing, if you think back to the data that happened, biosphere report is when they were forced to publish their emissions uh, in 2003. They were required from 2001 on to report their emissions to Environment Canada, but initially these were kept as secret databases and uh, they were challenged in courts by equal justice and courts uh, uh, required them to put them. You can just uh, Google on the four letters NPRI, and this huge spreadsheet will pop up where you can look for your favorite contaminant, your favorite company, and see how much they're spewing out every year. These are for the oil sands, largely from the two upgraders. You can see what's happening. This is the three key pollutants in that area mercury, arsenic, and lead. And uh, obviously, they're putting this into the atmosphere, and they're sitting right next to the river. And uh, all these tributaries and wetlands alongside, for sure, you can some of that is getting done. So, what some of us decided to do in 2007 was to uh, do our own study. Uh, the three top people on this list myself, Jeff Short, and Peter Hodson, ironically, were hired by Alberta to piece together the case for the CN spill into Lake Lobbaman, which was uh, 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 Bunker C, which has the same pollutants in it as the tar sands. In doing that, uh, while we were sitting around the table, our conversation sort of naturally turned to the tar sands. Jeff Short is the chemist for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration who uh, designed the chemical program after the Exxon Valdez and uh, ran it for two decades. Peter Hodson is a well-known toxicologist at Queens who's done a lot of work in the oil sand. So we raised some money and hired Aaron Kelly, who had finished her PhD with me a few years before, working on her. And uh, all of these lines point to our sampling sites. We had three per tributary and a chain from above Fort McMurray 
just emerging as, as being very toxic contaminants. One of the attractions was that uh, uh, these were found uh, in some reviews in the 2005 to 2007 period to be very toxic. Toxic in lower concentrations than the RAM program was measured. Jeff had a better method for measuring they used a, a membrane to accumulate them. It's just a, a piece of a special polyethylene. And their samplers were just pieces of aluminum pipe that were specially clean. They had a grid of pegs in there that you could line some membrane on, seal uh, the thing with a cover on each end, and a, a piece of chain, weight it, just throw it in the river and leave it for a month, and then extract the membrane and get it in. that they've done extensive intercalibration with Loa labs. They weren't using these uh, in 2007, 2008. Uh, George Bush was president. He wasn't given any money for environmental stuff. So we just borrowed their samples. Right? Uh, we had to get them back this year, actually. But uh, we, we got this equipment for free. Values that they were able to detect were a thousand times lower than what the rat program And this is the Athabasca River. As you can see, it's ice covered for about five months a year, mostly, which poses some special problems for monitoring and toxicity. So I'm going to talk primarily about snow results here because this is one thing they were measuring at all. You can see that the snow was visibly gray when you flew over the area. This is on that same Muskeg River. And, uh, I showed you our sites earlier. You can see the episodic events in the snow pack here when the wind was blowing in the right direction. What we did was to take cores of this snow and melt them down and filter them. And after filtering, this is what the filters look like. These were originally this is the upstream end of the river in Fort McMurray going down to Fort Chip. And each of these branches is a tributary. And you can see this general higher concentration uh, toward the center of the oil sands. Uh, the two big upgraders are right in site AR6 here. The yellow numbers are kilometers between our sampling sites and other industrial developments are in red. And the community 
these are other features that we out to the first site oil sand research was shown in blue. So overall, this was a, a grid of 226 by uh, 74, I think it is, kilometers that uh, we sampled in March 2008. After filtering, this is what the snow looked like. These are big stainless steel pots at a remote site. It's nice, colorless water. This blue is the bottom of the top of this repeated flame. Near the site, there is actually an oil slump on top of the water. We actually had to order up some more pots to complete this because it was impossible to clean the pot after uh, one of those sites well enough to, to do another site with confidence. If you wipe one out, you take the towel. That's what you take the towel. Well, to, to uh, make a long story short, we found that uh, when you looked at the uh, concentration or the fall per cubic per square meter of surface, it was an exponential fall away from the oil sands. These are just three fractions of the, uh, of the particulates and uh, polycyclic aromatic compounds. This red line is 50 kilometers. And we decided by eye that that was uh, a cutoff rather than doing anything fancy because, this, as you can see, we didn't have very many samples of that big radius. But this material was small enough to be filled in the way. When you plotted concentrations in that snowpack uh, at these various sites, the black on these bars is in that particular fraction. The red is smoked in it. All fraction and the sum of the two is the total in the uh, snow. You can see uh, just like a bullseye pattern for those upgraders. And these are the various uh, sites that were done on tributaries, and you can see that for many of them it's the same pattern of increase. I'll just, uh, uh, this is the Athabasca from Fort McMurray going north to Fort Chippewa. I'll go through a few of these, I've done dozens of these for different compounds. This is total polycyclic aromatics, mercury in the pattern, very much the same, arsenic, very much the same, lead, very much the same, and finally vanadium, which is regarded even by the companies as an indicator that uh, uh, the source is between because it's very high in between. So, Big fallout from the snowpack onto the river, onto the watershed that drains to the river. Uh, Environment Canada has picked this up and is going to be looking at spring now this coming spring. And if you looked at the sites within 50 kilometers, shown by as the gray, gray bars here, versus the white bars which are outside that, you can see that within that 50 kilometer area. Virtually any substance your measure was higher or developed. No surprise. When you looked at tributaries, we found the same thing. This is just the midstream sites, uh, upstream of development, but within the Dune area, the Curry Formation, versus the, uh, the downstream of development sites. The gray bars here are the summer, and the black ones are winter. But you can see that in almost every case, uh, considerable addition by industry. Uh, this got a little messy because when we did the GIS mapping, we had areas with no development versus areas with development. We did the sampling, and then the next set of GIS photos came out, and we found that between 2006 and 2008, there was considerable development. It ended up as a less than 25% disturbance versus greater than 25 if you analyze it. But the message is the same. Industry does that to pull up these contaminants. And this is the mainstream river. And again, it's going downstream as you look up here. And just a few examples. Again, the gray bars are summer and the black ones are, are winter. 
uh, up the upstream of the development. The development is all the samples in the developed area through D and D is downstream of development and the Avon has to Delta. The LA is laid out the last one. And you can see that uh, again the highest bars are almost always in the area of development. But they're carried a considerable ways downstream, certainly well downstream in some cases. Things uh, Lake Athabasca, right at the mouth of the river, was still higher than the upstream of development. So, again, uh, while the concentrations are low, they do show that industry is adding the pollutants of the river. Now, just some comparisons uh, the red lines on the, this next couple of graphs are the uh, best limits of detection any one of these so-called polycyclic aromatic homologs that, uh, that RAMP could do. In fact, some of them is 200, not 20. Some of them is 200. That being their best limit of detection, these being our actual measurements, you can see why, why they can validate claim if you can see anything going into the river. This is the highest site we be found. Calculated as 700 nanograms per liter, well up into the range of the toxic. They came uh, out with a figure of 300 below the one of the toxic. So it's a pretty important difference. So the message is if you want to claim if you're an industry and want to be able to claim that uh, you can't detect it because you're putting anything into the environment, just get the, the most incompetent sampling program and the lousiest chemical labs can and turn them loose. The chances are they'll give you all of the information you want to put in your propaganda. So, uh, RAMP wouldn't have detected anything in that winter sample. In summer, we got 682, and they would have got 353, and the limit for toxicity is considered to be 400. So, we published that up, put out these two papers, and I put a, another little summary uh, criticizing the management of that program. But uh, the, the results that we reported were not really all that bad. We found a few exceedances in the bridge water. Uh, some exceeded uh, the ministry guidelines for aquatic life. But nothing that really surprising. Now, the problem is that ministers tend to focus on this. In a development that's doubling every 10 years, when it takes seven or eight years from approval to getting a plant operated, you want to have chemistry that's good enough that you can anticipate what the situation is going to be several years down the road after you've invested a couple of billion dollars in development. So I think it's a bad focus to just focus on numbers of exceedances. You want to be able to project ahead and see when those exceedances are likely to be increasing in frequency. Uh, Environment Canada doesn't have any problem understanding that with an Alberta call that we have seen to. So uh, we didn't uh, make much of all of this, except to point out that there are no guys for polycyclic aromatic compounds. But when you compare what we found to the fishery fat, you can see it's a violation. This is the section that Environment Canada is responsible for enforcing. They don't have guidelines or limits. It's just unlawful to deposit a harmful substance in or near a fish bearing stream, period. So clearly these companies were violating. But although I sent a copy of this paper to the ministers uh, before it was published out of courtesy, uh, this is what the ministers proclaimed uh, after the papers came out. This is the Alberta Minister of Environment. His old 
story that was all natural. And uh, the federal minister said the same thing that his scientists had always told them that the contaminants were naturally occurring. And of course, they didn't have much going on in the way of programs. They were hearing this from their counterparts in Alberta. But the first thing that happened is actually the premier said, well, this guy has been right on a few things before. Maybe we should get some other scientists to look at the data. So I immediately left them and wrote him an email and said, yes, why don't you get the Royal Society to appoint some people who are expert in monitoring and so on to, uh, to have a look, look at our papers and what else is going on. And I didn't get a response right away because he was off shooting American politicians in the East somewhere. But meanwhile, Jim Prentiss, who was then Minister of Environment, federally phoned me up one day and said, look, I was talking to some of my senior scientists, and they tell me that I ought to pay attention to these papers. I fly to Alberta today. Can you meet me at the airport over them? So Aaron and I went to the airport in the evening and we got a little room and sat with the minister and showed him our data. And at the end, he said, well, I believe that you're really on to something, but what should I do? He made the same suggestion. And he acted that night, formed a federal panel, uh, four members of the Royal Society on it, and three other experts, including some people you'll know, like John Small, and Peter Dillon, and Joe Rasmussen, and uh, gave them two months to look at the final I thought it would be logical for the uh, province to join in and make a response to the panel, but no, they had to appoint their own. So they appointed another panel. And what we ended up with is no fewer than six panels studying our data and monitoring program uh, in the past year. And without exception, they said that we were right, that monitoring was uh, efficient this Royal Society one was independent of ours. Uh, it actually only had one member of the Royal Society on it. Fire Canada had four members. The grant review panel had one. This was a, the independent review. Nothing to do with our data that I mentioned. The Alberta Environment Data Review Panel uh, had four members of the Royal Society on it as well. When they reported what the minister didn't want to hear, he then appointed another panel to design a world-class monitoring panel. And in July, that panel reported he didn't really like what they said, but he felt that he was painted into a corner and swore that they would be acting on it immediately and forming this world-class monitoring panel, which was recommended to be independent any federal or provincial government agency because there's been so much mistrust built up by propaganda that was unsupported. Well, there's still no action on that. To their credit, after this report came out in December of last year, uh, Environment Canada immediately formed a panel to design a monitoring study. Uh, some of the people who were on this panel invited the uh, a few other people at large and now have a phase one, which is hydrology and chemistry, and phase two monitoring plan, which is biology, that you can access on the web. They're very detailed. Uh, the estimated costs run from 20 to 50 million dollars a year, which is about profits from three hours of oil sand. But nobody seems willing to really fund that right now. So things are in sort of a stalemate. And then just to top things off, the Auditor General a few years ago, or a few months ago, uh, seconded what all these panels had said uh, with respect to the monitoring program. Uh, the most unkind things were said by this provincial panel, which uh, the government tried to to prevent coming 
out by rewriting it and, and all sorts of things. But the panel held firm and insisted on their own report. So they said this fabled uh, 4 million data point program was not intended to assess the impact of their oil sales, uh, which was obvious to those of us who really knew how to monitor it. Here's the laboratory zone for environment here to not have the capability to record concentrations of polycyclic aromatics. So, and efficiencies in sampling design and methodology. Exactly the same thing with the rat And then this is their view on our studies. So, at this point, I'm probably the most hated man in, in uh, political circles in Alberta. Now, these are just some of the press articles that have come out. Uh, the final one here uh, was uh, an editorial by the editor of the Edmonton Journal demanding that the government apologize to him for the that I want to talk for a few minutes about what needs to be uh, done by the One of the complaints by people downriver has been that. Uh, Fish are, are coming up with boomers and deformities of all kinds that they never used to have. And in investigating that a little bit more, I did a couple of things. I went on a fishing trip way down the past, and while I was there, I interviewed a number of fishing guys. None had ever seen a deformity. This was the center of the east end of the lake. I also knew two people who had. Uh, Seventies on this Western science people, David Donald, Mark Canada, and Ian Hart, who is a long-term uh, consultant, used to be fisheries for the province. They had handled up to 20,000 fish a year, and we see any more in the seventies and early eighties. So their story was the same as the native fisher. Then these studies, which uh, came out of Leeds University, uh, started describing some of the deformities that they were seeing in studies of fish eggs and embryos that they hatched on sediments that were contaminated with the same deformity. They found very high mortalities, up to 95%, and among the survivors, a very high incidence of uh, various deformities, uh, I, I just put up one sentence here, but uh, I could find several more, and I noted that when I started looking for two years, two years ago, I put a freezer in Fort Chip and some forms in the nursing station so that people could bring in fish and park the location where they were caught and leave us the fish to look at. Uh, here's some of them. Uh, seems to me that it's likely that the fish that they're catching and what's so nasty are just these embryos grown up. And I think that really needs investigating. I'll bet they're not very high in contaminants, which is what they're afraid of, because they swim downstream and do most of their growing and right down the past. But I don't think we should expect native people. Even anyhow, if you saw these on a Safeway shelf, you would buy them and take them. Most of the people there won't even feed them to their dogs, so we might as well be contaminated. Hear a lot now about over that, uh, that stuff is not uh, what we're going to do all over. This is the area that I've been talking about, so my area up here. Most of the, the development is going to be by this in situ process where they inject steam down one more hole, melt the human and then. Uh, Something back up another pipe alongside. In fact, at 
one state over 20 years ago, there were plans to drop nuclear weapons in here in California. And we had to do that. In the minds of some, those plans are still fine. This is a big area. This is 100 kilometers from Big Curry to there. This is about another 100 down to here. Uh, these are two native communities. And this is the first to development that's going to be the landscape uh, and it's complete. The uh, network of first seismic lines, then uh, roads and well pads with the little squares you can see, and routes for pipelines are just very, very dense. And the disturbance is so great that none of the big mammals, such as little terrible or any of the large predators, uh, will live in that landscape. So, while they're right, we leave 90% of the trees behind, in fact, they've created a million landscape for all of the, the natural, at least the large mammals. So, again, uh, to native people, we depend on their advice and so forth. Not a great scenario. So, I think there's some log logical next steps. Uh, they need to uh, control airborne emissions. We do it in power plants in the south. You do it here in Sudbury. Why can't they do it there? Uh, if you were to log, you're required not to go near streams and so on. Why not have similar setbacks required for mining? Failing ponds, we can do it out totally. And our own engineering department has developed methods to do away with failing ponds. Companies don't And they need to get busy with reclamation, both of the ponds and the mines. Uh, should be reclaiming at the same rate that they're mining, just as coal mines are required to do. They need to settle the size of big reserves for some of the large wildlife. They need to get native people on board, whether this is uh, as shareholders in these companies or, or whatever. Right now, they get a few low paid jobs uh, pushing. And this is the one we're working on right now. We need a professionally run monitoring program so we can find out what's happening in grant. Grant program should be close. When uh, the EIAs are done, and there's three coming up this year, we need a monitoring program that can be used as a basis for doing that. Now they, they hire a bunch of consultants who hire a bunch of students. They send out big few grab samples and they identify up the benefit invertebrates to order. And then they do species diversities on them. And the panel to set that um, we published a paper on that or tried to be not out of any journal. Uh, but it doesn't seem to bother the hearing process. And uh, this is my on uh, these things. They might call it a hearing process, but it's like going to a, a play or an opera. No matter who's playing the characters, you know what the outcome is going to be. It's all over when the fat lady sings. In the uh, three fat ladies who sit on the, uh, on the uh, energy and utilities board, they're usually three fat engineers. So, uh, we really need to improve the way things are done. Uh, I don't know what you call all of this, but I certainly don't call it ethical oil. Thank you. Government on their own at Stelmont have proclaimed that they were not going to approve any more uh, developments of failing ponds. 
then again a year later when the new development came on, big grandfather and million spots for them. So it's the companies know they can get away with it. It's a true Petros thing. I guess the only difference in Nigeria is uh, they, they only assassinate your character in Alberta. I've still got all my teeth on the fingernails. They, they just totally extract the water, and so they produce dry tailings. Now, I'm kind of suspicious of those, too, but the tailings produced by most mining operations are dry, and when rain and snow run through those, you still get acid mine rain out of them because the sulfide in the rocks goes on to the highest. As a result of being acid, you also get lots of trace metals. So I like them not to just approve a whole new suite of mines to do that. What they ought to do is go a little bit slow and try one or two of them, see if they can contain the contaminants. At least they should not have those threatening ponds hanging over the river. So much for the Constitution. If you look at the expertise, Alberta has virtually none. Uh, where, uh, at least for the next few years, the federal government still has some, some pretty good scientists to run these programs, and hopefully there will be a couple left from our perspective. But uh, uh, it's looking kind of iffy because they're all within a few years of my age.
you see what can be done on this pipeline. You know, and it's obvious that our politicians weren't just used to farmers and ranchers being those pipelines that are in Kansas. I don't think the environmental groups really had anything to do with what went on there. Uh, if citizens will stand up for what they want, the, uh, I think it's not so much that they love these companies, they love the money. You know, when you create lots of jobs, with your feet on the desk, and have enough money for rolling in that you're not having budget problems all the time, which was the case until a couple of years ago, that's just a dream land for politicians. You're, you'll instantly, without raising a hand, be one of the, uh, the uh, most revered politicians in all of this. It's hard to resist. <laughs> Really? 